what's up y'all it's zach we live in corporate and look i'm always excited every time i come on here to like uh, share the guests that we have because you know we just continue to give y'all ridiculously hot content for the free ski uh every week and i'm i'm honored that we're in a position to have these opportunities to speak with the folks that we speak to and i'm thankful to those individuals for giving us their time so freely and so willingly um today we have a really impressive guest and you know the second white male on our platform our flagship podcast and the first white male ceo xander lurie xander lurie is the ceo of survey monkey and serves on its board of directors which he has been a part of since 2009. Previously, Xander was the Senior Vice President of Entertainment at GoPro. He has served on the company's Board of Directors since 2016. Prior to GoPro, Xander was the SVP of Strategic Development at CBS Corporation via his acquisition of CNET Networks, where he served as Chief Financial Officer and Head of Corporate Development. Xander began his career in the Technology Investment Banking Group at J.P. Morgan, leading equity transactions and mergers and acquisitions in the internet sector. He holds a JD and an MBA from Emory University and a BA in political science from the University of Washington. Xander is co-founded the California-based nonprofit organization Coach Art, which serves chronically ill children and their siblings. So I'm excited. I read the bio. I wanted to make sure what you're going to hear. We got right into the interview with Xander because the CEO, I try to like, you know, let's just get right into it. So I'm trying to maximize my time with this man. So the next thing you're going to hear is my interview with Xander. Make sure y'all check out uh, the show notes because there's a, a super cool survey or dope. I'm going to say dope. It is dope. Super dope survey that survey monkey has created to uh, galvanize uh, perspectives on uh, marginalized experiences and just experiences at work. And so I want to make sure I share that with y'all again, just sharing resources um, I think it's a really good survey, not only for you to take so you can understand, but then also if you're like a, a diversity, equity, inclusion practitioner, like it's just really good experience for you to take like a, a, a an expertly crafted survey from a company that makes surveys um, as it can help maybe inform your own strategy. So it's not only an experience for you, but it's also a learning for you, too. Right. So the next thing, again, you're going to hear is my, my conversation with Xander Lurie, CEO of SurveyMonkey. Until next time, y'all. Peace. Xander, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? I'm doing well, Zach. Nice to talk to you. Look, you know, um, you know, living corporate, as you know, like we exist to center and amplify black and brown voices. And with that being said, you know, we seek aspirational allies on our platform. But believe it or not, you're the second. You're only the second white guy on living corporate. And we've had like almost 300 episodes. Like, how does that make you feel? What? Yeah. Jeez. You, you, it's time for you to start diversifying your uh your interview slots. I'm humbly uh, invited and <laughs> thrilled to occupy that title. So thank you. You're welcome. Well, here's the thing. It's I'm trying to diversify. I don't know. I, well, th- we can get into it. I, I, th- I need your help, right? I need I need you to I need you to work alongside me and get some get some more of your bread platform. I'd love to have more of you guys on. I just it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to uh, tough to get you guys. So look, are get- you kidding me? That that's an easy ask. If you want to meet more white dudes. I am happy to uh, <laughs> to make connections, and I'm sure they would love to speak with your audience. So uh, let's make that happen. Okay, no, I'm gonna hold you to hold you to that off mic, though. So don't don't be it. cute. Okay, all right. Uh, now uh, let's get to it. You're the CEO of a globally recognized technology company. Like, walk me through just what's been going on through your mind this year, around the year. Like, we're talking about you know George Floyd and Black Lives Matter protests, to COVID, to the economy. To this current political landscape, we just had, of course, uh, the death of uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and we have the election coming up. I mean, like, take me into the mind of a tech chief executive officer, just for a second. Well, I mean, 2020 is the year that is a decade. There's the saying, I think it was one of the Russian oligarchs said, you know, some years nothing happens and some years everything happens. And it's just, this is one of those years. Somebody somebody asked me about the Super Bowl halftime episode with Shakira. And, you know, I was like, oh my, that was this year? That was like a hundred years ago. I forgot about that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it started in early March with the pandemic and then everybody working from home. And that was a shock to the economy and flip it off and then the murders of George Floyd and in mid-May, which led to the protests and people really waking up to all the social inequality and justice that your audience knows all too well. Um, 
you know, the political turmoil, RBGs passing. I mean, it's a, it's just a really challenging year. So, you know, in many ways, I think my job as CEO is a little bit um, more like everybody else's job in the company today, right? We're all working from home. We're all navigators of this environment and kids at home and taking care of parents and trying to stay safe, masks, and stay entertained. I haven't been on a plane in seven months. Right. And I'm just trying to keep the team engaged and focused and delivering for our customers, all while taking on some new challenges uh, in the realm of social justice, which is worth uh, much more time now than I ever have. You know, well, we're going to get to that, right? You know, what are you excited about? When you look at the next 12 months and then like on the flip side of that, like what are you nervous about? Well, I think to to have the position I have, you have to be an optimist and you have to have things to look forward to. If you don't, you just won't have the energy um, to inspire and motivate the 1300 people who work at SurveyMonkey serving 6,000 plus customers. So I'm excited about the future of technology. I think, you know, this year, while we've seen so much wreckage in the economy and so many jobs lost, we've also seen this digital transformation where, as Satya Nadella from Microsoft said, five years of transformation happened in five months. So we are seeing the power of teachers adapting to Zoom and companies that are able to adapt in this you know, world where we can't go to the office. You're seeing retail companies adapt quite well. So I am inspired by the power of technology, the power to bend innovation. Um, you know, for me, the biggest challenges right now are to just keep our people engaged and motivated in a world where there's a little less dynamism and a little less uh, diversity of place where you go to mm. work. You know, I think many of it's just too much Zoom. There's mental health issues that all CEOs are talking about inside their companies. And, you know, I think now more than ever, the role of the CEO is head of HR. Yeah. We are head of a group of people and there's never been more focus on the quality of your culture, the quality of your values, and ultimately, you know, our people are our assets. You know, many companies don't have patents to protect their business. We don't have supply chain that protect our business or exclusive vendor contracts. We have talented people that design, build, ship, and sell software yep. in the tech space. And my job is to drive that strategy and keep people really stoked to uh, want to work at SurveyMonkey. You know, I think to that to that end, right, in terms of like, how the the role of the CEO can be more and more people centric. You know, what have you been doing to help develop that muscle? And and I'm look, I'm looking at you with this shirt on right now. You you clearly go to the gym. So I'm not talking about your physical muscles. You look great. Okay. I'm, talk <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about this developmental capability um to really uh, drive empathy. And we're going to get into that. When we talk about the social justice thing that you alluded to earlier, but you know, you, you, you mentioned it. So I'm, I'm increasingly curious. What does that look like for you developmentally to shift to that space? Well, I, I credit our chief people officer, Becky Cantieri with really helping instill um, a focus on culture many years ago. She's been in Serving Monkey for seven years. And we, you know, long before the really believed and invested in culture as a competitive advantage, recognizing that it's hard to recruit engineers and salespeople from Salesforce and Google and Facebook. And when you're headquartered in the Valley, you know, incredibly astute about where to invest their time and their talent. And if you didn't have a culture that really enabled people to do the best work of their lives, enabled people to bring their whole selves to work, uh, enabled people to have a feeling that the cultusive, then I think you were at risk of losing your best talent. So we long invested in culture. And I think in many ways, people were wondering why we spent so much airtime on culture and values. And I think it's paying off for us today. We are reaping the dividends of a place where people felt we cared deeply about them and their families and our benefits reflected that. And our values ultimately, you know, I always say our values really reflect who we hire, who we promote, how we pay and who we fire. And now more than ever, we are seeing the value of it and we are seeing that we fell short. I fell short. We weren't doing enough to invest in the e and I. And I think now the environment is so welcoming for CE to step up speak about what they care about, reflect the cares of their employees and their customers, and do what's good for not only the community, uh, but for our own businesses. So I'm investing incredible amount of time in getting this right, and we've got a long way to go. So with that being said, let's talk about black equity specifically. And pointedly, I'm curious, what is it that you've learned and you, you know, you're continuing to learn, like not only as a white man, but as a white executive and how you can leverage your access 
to your influence and your capital in tangible ways. And, and I say this. So look, you know, Xander, look, I'm a black man, 31 years old. I'm a manager at like, you know, at a big four consulting firm. So like, I don't really have any real power, right, man? I'm like one of these cogs in the machine. Like when I see y'all, like when I say y'all, I'm talking about like white male executives, particularly CEOs. I feel like I project a lot. You know what I mean? Like I project how much power I think y'all have. I I project how much money I think y'all make. And so like, I'd like to get like a practical, like you to ground me a little bit, right? Cause mm-hmm. I don't know what y'all do, right? In my mind, I'm thinking like, you know, maybe you gargle with like whale tears and mm-hmm. like you, you know, I don't know. I really just, I have no idea what kind I of- I do. <laughs> well, when I wake up in the morning, um, three of my minions put a crown on my head. I would imagine. And I'll start, they'll start feeding me grapes right? before <laughs> um, my, my caviar eggs are prepared. <laughs> uh, Zach, I think you are selling yourself short, man. You got a ton of- uh, a ton of brain power and audience and a voice that um, that is respected and that that is power in in this in this day and age especially when we're all trapped on our podcast i respect that zoom boxes so you know look i think where i have grown here you know at survey monkey i'm super proud of the fact we have a board of directors that has five men and five women including two black women i believe we're the only public company in america with two black women on its board but um We've always talked about diversity. When I say diversity, I'm usually referring to the numbers. You know, how are we doing recruiting Latinx employees? How are we doing with black leadership? You know, if you look at our total population of vice presidents, et cetera. So we're always slicing the numbers to evaluate how we're doing in each function, and et cetera. But I think what we have, what I have learned personally this year is that I wasn't focused enough on the I in DE&I. And inclusivity is really about how do our black and brown employees feel? Yeah. How how are they truly being valued at work? You know, are there microaggressions that I don't see? And what I've learned since these murders, and I've really said publicly, like, I'm going to spend more time on this than I am on product and I am on sales and I'm doing lunches on Zoom and I'm interviewing for never, is really just asking the stories and listening and learning about the journeys that I've never experienced as a white guy who grew up with privilege and didn't have to overcome the obstacles that you overcame in a in a tech world that you know is too white Mm. so i think if if i was doing this in 2019 i think a lot of people would have been like what is going on why is he so maniacally focused on this yeah yeah but now i'm here and i'm not going to relent we are not going to let time temper our ambitions to get stronger here you know I, i that's that's awesome and it's it's exciting to hear and you're right i mean you know everyone's asking okay like you know Zach, you know, you, you talk to all these people, you know, considering your exposure and your space, the space you inhabit, is there any one organization that not like, you know, you can point to us as an example. And I said, look, the, the sad reality is to say like, I can point to you. There's different brands that are doing some different things externally that are like really good headlines. Right. But if you're asking me what organization is, have, has like a comprehensive systemic plan to get at this moment as like the North star, I'd say no. Right. Um, but I think what's really exciting um, as we have this conversation is that there are organizations that are actively driving to do uh, what is right by their black and brown employees and by their marginalized uh, stakeholder groups and communities. You know, I'm not asking you to, to name any names. Uh, you want to. I mean, look, it'd be great content mm-hmm. for a living corporate, to be clear. Um, but if but but um, can we talk a little bit about like your executive network? Right. Like, what does it look like for you? to engage your fellow CEOs and to leverage, you know, again, like the social capital you have, right? You, you talked earlier about the vendors and the partnerships you have and the relationships you have. You know, one is how are you influencing your colleagues to shift their mindset and behaviors? And then two, as they look across the board, um, what would you say is like top of mind for them that you've observed? Like if you if you look at the culture of executives right now or your cohort, like what would you say you're, you're observing? Yeah, I, mean, I, I could share a lot here. I, I would say that in early March, I got together with 17 other CEOs of public uh, SaaS businesses. And we get together on some every Thursday at three o'clock and have an hour conversation about whatever big challenges in front of us. And it's evolved over the last six months. But this is a group, you know, that includes slack and zoom and upwork and pager duty and workday and we are all talking about this specific issue more than anything else i would say we've you know we spent the first couple months talking about how do we adapt in a work from home 
environment, a lot about technology and go to market when you can't go to the office. But really since May, we've been focused on how we drive more diversity, not only in our employee bases, but in our leadership team and board. How do we provide for a more inclusive culture for people to bring their whole selves to work and do their very best work? And how do we use our voice and our products to have a bigger influence in where we live? So we're all talking about how we can get better at recruiting. And I'll say one advantage of this pandemic is that people are starting to open their minds about, hell, we can work from anywhere, so we should be recruiting from anywhere. And we don't all need to be recruiting group out of Stanford and Berkeley around the Valley. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of interviews now with people all over the map, and I'm seeing incredible talent uh, when we open up our peripheral vision. Secondly, on the inclusivity, you know, we're all getting trained. We've started the Justice Collective to bring in trainers to help teach our middle managers and our white allies or our aspiring white allies how to be better. You know, how do you talk to people who are feeling incredibly triggered by the social media killings that we've seen? And how do you open up to listen and provide space for people uh, when they can't focus on, you know, coding or selling? Um, and then, you know, we're doing some things in the industry, which, you, you know, you touched on, which I think are super innovative, uh, which leverage our balance sheet. My friend, John, Brent, we talked about how do we put our money to work um, beyond SurveyMonkey? So we've partnered with 22 other companies, including uh, Intuit and Zoom and the Golden State Warrior. And, um, and what we're doing is we are sending out a survey to all of our vendors where we collectively spend billions with a B to ask them, tell us about your board, your leadership team, your diversity, what you're doing to drive inclusivity. And we are evaluating that data in terms of where we spend our money with marketing agencies, cloud technology suppliers, uh, food vendors, auditors, law firms. And if people don't provide the answers or they give us answers that we find insufficient, we're going to move on. You know, it's a competitive universe. So we can take our, our money and dedicate it to people in the brown community better. You know, I, I, I love that. I love that. You know, you talked about recruiting. So it's interesting, you know, especially in the tech space. There's and of course, but there's op eds around, but people continue to use the excuse of, you know, it's not us, it's them. There's not a pipeline, right? Um, and you talk about kind of expanding your net to recruit and interview talent from places beyond. And I'm curious, as you continue to interview and like change and shift your interviewing approaches, have there been more pointed conversations about how to black and brown? Uh, undergrad student organizations, not just at the HBCUs, but at the predominantly white universities as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a popular topic. Um, it is easy for white to say, you know, we want to be more diverse. We want to drive more inclusivity. Um, but it's hard to have an inclusive workforce when you go onto a floor of sales folks and there's one black guy and 150 white people. Um, it, it often comes back to the white leader not having black networks. And if mm. you're having a cocktail party or if, you know, you lived in a fraternity and you had no black friends, it's not a surprise that you're not able to hire black engineers. Or if you live in a community, um, you know, if you're a CEO lives in a very wealthy community, you might not have black neighbors. So when you go out looking for folks to add to your team, often your network is going to be the best place to start. And if it doesn't include black and brown people are probably going to come up short. So it's pushing all of us to get into other networks beyond HBCUs uh, where there is talent. And as Jeff Weiner and many others have said, talent is equally distributed. Opportunity is not. So we got to go find the talent and I mean different universities, different geographies, um, investing in agencies that, you know, have better access to black and brown talent. And it's a journey for all of us. And I, I haven't found a lot of white CEOs who are really good at it yet. Now, if you're hiring at massive scale, then the pipeline issue starts to become more real. And that's where I think what we need to be doing is talking about the pipeline three years from now. And if you're a short-term CEO, that might be hard to swallow, but maybe you need to be investing more in internships, investing more in training programs, you know, putting more of your products into universities so that you can teach um, aspiring um, technology executives or, or computer scientists how to code, even though you can't hire them in 2020, you might be in for 2024. And if you have a long-term focus, you'll be glad you did. You know, I can hear your intention as we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and, you know, where SurveyMonkey um, still has to go and how you're continuing to grow and change and shift. And, and, and you also name drop um, a few organizations, individuals that you're working with, 
um, in the spirit of that. You know, there's already talks around how momentum is slowing down around uh, the focus around, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, specifically around anti-racism against white supremacy. I'm curious for you, considering where you sit, you know, what plans or, or what, if all, do you have in mind to not lose momentum with SurveyMonkey? Well, I can't speak for other companies. I can only speak for SurveyMonkey that if you're working with me or if you're a leader on our team, you're going to be vigilant and focused on DEI or you won't be at this company. It's just, it's too core to what we do. It's too important to our team that we get it right. It's too important to our customers, to our shareholders, to our board. So, you know, nobody would ever come to me and say, hey, Xander, you know, I just feel like we've been so focused on revenue growth. I'm kind of over that, man. You know, or hey, Xander, like we were super innovative the last few years in our product development, but like this year, like let's just let's just not focus as much on delivering for customers. Like you you'd fire that person. Right. So, you know, if they lose focus and lose vigilance on providing a culture that drives diversity and equity and inclusion, they're not going to work here. And if other companies do that, you know, we'll poach their employees. They'll get run off the side of the road. I, I think <laughs> there is so much momentum to get this right. And from all the CEOs in, in our group that I get with, um, there is not only a personal conviction, but it's reflected inside their employee base and their customers. And, you know, I, I've only cried twice at work yeah. every monkey in the last five years. I cried when my dear friend, Dave Goldberg, the CEO died. And I cried at work a lot then. And then I cried again this year, listening to the personal stories of my black colleagues who I'd never, I didn't know how much they had suffered and faced discrimination or microaggressions either at, at SurveyMonkey or in their earlier in their career. And it was sickening to hear. And I just felt shame that we hadn't been more focused on this before. Why did we need to see those killings on the news to get more internally focused? So now we've got that focus and we're not going to lose it. I mean, you know, we got time, right? So, because we've we've been knocking. It's interesting, you know. Let me just give you some f- feedback in real time. You know, I, I've had conversations with other leaders, and they kind of they have these really canned, like rushed responses. This interview has been not only, in my opinion, like impactful and thoughtful in your response, but also it's been like really time efficient. Like it's almost like you run like a global business or something. It's it's just incredible. Um, well, let me I mean, you- I, I appreciate the good words, but like this, this is you know, these are just words. You're right. You know, and I and I heard our employees say, like, if you just tweet and move on, you know, you're going to lose me. You're going to lose my loyalty. And birds are cheap. So, you know, we can all post and we can we can get on podcasts. But ultimately, it's about the numbers. It's about money. It's about promotions. It's about, you know, driving real change in the world. And, you know, I want to I want to do good work here. And I want to be remembered as somebody who and I perform its business, but also uh, really delivered on the DE and I goals we have. You set me up really well, really, honestly, for my second to last question, which is what I've been noticing is, is that broadly recognizing this is not specific to every white leader um, that a lot of times in these in these moments that have happened, because this, this has happened before. Like This is not the first time organizations have come together and made statements about equality, a different language. But again, this is not new. What I'm curious about and what I've noticed is, is that sometimes in this moment, white leaders they're happy to do it as long, but if they do the work there, they're still sensitive to being challenged by the marginalized people in question, right? So, you know, if, if someone was to raise their hand and be like, okay, yeah, but this is, this is still going on, or hey, I have this problem, they're like, okay, what else do you want me to do? Don't you see I'm doing all this stuff, right? My question to you is, how do you continue to build your own resilience and stick to um, to not be fragile if and when your black colleagues, your black employees, uh, other marginalized people continue to give you challenging feedback in light of the work that you're doing as the CEO of Survey Monkey. Like, what does it look like for you to build that toughness to take that feedback and then continue to not get, you know, upset or retaliatory? Yeah, I think it depends on what kind of company you're running and what kind of leader you are. I mean, mm. Survey Monkey at its core is a feedback company. You know, our software yeah. is used by millions of people to share in sentiment about you know, their manager, about products, about the concert they went to, about their child's curriculum, et cetera. So if you're running SurveyMonkey and you don't have a growth mindset and you can't listen to feedback that you get from town halls and on slot, that's going to be a really tough position. So, I, you know, I like to think I have a growth mindset. I, yeah. Am I sensitive at times? You bet. You know, people yeah. say things that hurts to read. 
on email or on Glassdoor or, you know, in questions. And I've been held to the mat in this arena for sure. I've yeah. been I've been challenged on we're not doing enough. I've been challenged on you said something stupid. And usually the, the person challenging me is right. So I've learned to I've learned a ton and I think, you know, I in June, I got on our town hall and said, I feel so ill-equipped to be the leader during this time when the most important issue is equity in our workplace. Like, what the hell do I know right. as a white guy who, you know, like many other white leaders was kind of born on second base. Mm. I'm learning and I'm not going to, I'm not going to be shy about asking questions and, you know, especially listen to, you know, the, the black and brown colleagues I have and my board members and interview candidates um there's a lot to learn and watch and i'm on that journey look you know xander this has been a dope conversation um before we let you go you know you've dropped mad jewels to be clear right and we typically do sound effects but mad jewels mad jewels man jewels i like that one i appreciate that one no you should uh you you have my permission they're not theft any longer i have to be a a little bit more sensitive with using dope, but you pulled it off quite nicely. But mad jewels, sure. I'm going to repurpose and use mad frequently. Jewels, man. You, you, you drop mad jewels this whole conversation. So, like, any parting words, man, before we let you go? Um, parting words for folks in your audience. Um, obviously, we are uh, we're open to feedback. We're open to ideas. You know, many of the, the good ideas I think we are executing on now uh, surface from consultants, surface from outside friends. Uh, surface from CEO groups and others that were coming together asking what we can do differently this year than we did last. And I think that really is the challenge. I, you know, as I said uh, internally, at the end of this year, I don't want to look back and ask, you know, how did we respond and not have very tangible, specific goals and achievements. And even if we fall short, I'd rather fall short than not take some, you know, big swing. So, you know, for folks that have more ideas, folks that are interested in working at SurveyMonkey, I'm Xander at SurveyMonkey and uh, look forward to learning more, listening more, meeting more folks. And Zach, I appreciate you uh, asking questions and inviting me on your show. It's not a problem. Now, look, before we end this whole interview, uh, listen, everybody, you know, aspirational allies who who uh, who listen to Living Corporate. I want y'all to check this out, man. Look at this interview. OK, this man, Xander Laurie, he came on this platform. OK, he knew that I was going to ask him some real questions. He didn't back down and he wasn't all afraid and sensitive of Fry's image. He came and he did not take any type of, you know, what I'm saying awkward posture. Some of y'all hit me up. That's right. I'm going to take this moment right now to say something. Some of y'all hit me up and y'all want people to come on. And sometimes you only want your black faces to come on. Right. You don't want to bring on your CEOs. But check this out. This is the CEO of Survey Monkey coming and talking about the things he has to learn, things to continue to learn, things he continues to do. You have no excuse shout out to xander man i appreciate y'all listen you know what we're doing every single week we're doing what centering and amplifying black work by having real talk in the corporate world yes we typically talk to black and brown folks but every now and then we bring on some aspirational allies and like i said xander is the second yes that's right one two the second white man to be on living corporate and the first white male ceo i mean doesn't really get much better than that now look I'm feeling you. I'm feeling you, Zach. I appreciate the love. <laughs> uh, y'all, we're all over Beyonce's internet. You just check us out at Living Corporate. I'm not going to do emotional stuff at the end of this thing. Make sure you check out all the links, including the survey link that I already mentioned at the top of the show. Check that out there, too. Make sure y'all look, click, and learn about SurveyMonkey and about Xander. Till now, I'm Zach. You've been listening to Xander Lurie, CEO of SurveyMonkey. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.